Welcome to this episode of Exploring Glorantha, the first of 2023. I'm here as always with uh, Evan, uh, my co-host and scholar of all things Glorantha. And today we have a special guest. Returning is Mr. Suitcase himself, Rick Mites. Welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to see you both again. And to make it all the more a special occasion, speaking of Mr. Suitcase, I uh, put on my unique Chaosium Mr. Suitcase t-shirt that I got gifted at PAX Unplugged just uh, last December. So it's good timing on that. That's I wear it with pride. Yep. Well, Evan, do you want to introduce our, our show topic for today? Sure. Well, we, um, we are very fortunate in uh, this being the occasion of the recent release of the uh, Mites Index to Glorantha third edition. Um, uh, be, before, there we go. Um, and uh, I should say that JM and I were ready to go through the, the index uh, mm -hmm. with a free PDF, a complimentary PDF copy of yes. Chiasm, uh, for which we, we thank well, them. Learned it. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. And, uh, and um, so uh, this is, well, rather than me describing it, let me go to the author, who is Rick Mites, who has has graciously joined us yet again our third i believe interaction with uh, with rick yeah. on exploring third Glorantha. times the charm hopefully. that's right yeah. so tell us tell us about the uh what is its uh, origin and uh, for for our audience uh, who, who may or may not be familiar with it and uh, and and why this third edition well back in the 90s while i was living in the uk I had the pleasure to go to some small, mainly Glorantham based conventions, in particular Convulsion in Leicester in the UK, held every other summer in even numbered years. And also every year down in about May or June in Bacharach in an honest to goodness castle on the Rhine at the Tentacles Convention. And one of the favorite parts of both of those conventions, along with every annual Glorantham was that I would be one of the auctioneers at their collectibles auctions. And over that amount of time of doing, you know, three or four auctions a year like that, I built up a lot of descriptive uh, patter that I would talk about some of the core items because people always wanted to know what was in each item. Mm -hmm. You know, what's in Cults of Prax? And I would tell them the good and the bad or whatever, but with Cults of Prax, it's all good. Right. And, but there were some items that that were infamously bad that, I kind of became known as the guy who just knew what was in everything. And along the way, people, you know, started saying, hey, Rick, where would I find X or where would I find Y? You know about all these things. And quite frankly, with the rate things were coming out, it became harder and harder to know where everything was and which magazine had this type of article in it or which book had which cult or where, would, where could you find it? There was a scenario about, you know, this. What was it in? And so... I just started writing lists of things down and my collector's list started out as what I wanted to add to my collection. Mm -hmm. But as it grew, it was what was already in it because I didn't want to buy things two or three times or I'd get home thinking, I, I finally got this issue of the magazine and it was the wrong issue that I bought. And I, now I had two instead of the one I was missing. And so it all just started from me being a really obsessive completist collector and a little bit of a know-it-all and then trying to have just a sense of humor along the way, describing things in a lighthearted manner, uh, those kind of things. And so people said, you know, you have enough of the info. Why don't you just write a book? And so that's where the, the MIG came about. You know, even the title was me being lighthearted and a little bit jokey. You know, the Mines Index to Glorantha started out with MIG-1 in 96 and then MIG-2 in 99 and eventually people said well if it keeps coming out this rate you'll get up to mig 31 someday that's because, right you know we all firefox the movie you know yeah. <laughs> you know so but I'm, I'm happy to at least 20 years after the last edition came out plus a little bit to get a much more comprehensive bigger definitive you know third edition of it out well, and this edition is beautiful. It's full color. There's a ton of great pictures uh, from along the way, all of the, the images of the magazines and the books. There's a ton of great behind the scene uh, insights, the what never was, like things that were mentioned but never came out. Uh, my, my one little gem that I, I did not know 
that I was going to love about this is in the miscellaneous magazine section, my wife bought me a stack of uh, dragon magazines for Christmas that she found at a, uh, at like an antique mall. And about seven of them I now know have uh, Glorantha material because yeah. of the index. You know where to look. I know yeah. where to look. I know that issue 40, 55, or 51 and 129 have have these things. So, Evan, um, let's start with you. What stood out about um, the MIG that you you really appreciated? And maybe uh, at, you said you had you had questions. Let's start. Yeah. Let's start asking them. All questions are welcome. Well, sure. Well, so one of the things um, that uh, that struck me um, was that uh, there have been a lot of miniatures made for Glorantha. And, you know, they started out in, it, you know, early on in, in the uh, early, in the late 70s, 80s, um, in, in that, you know, sort of uh, very small, you know, production culture and everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but also what struck me as your commentary was that they didn't sell very well, very often. A lot of people put a lot of brilliant creativity mm -hmm. and artistry into amazing lines of miniatures going back to 1976. And unfortunately, every one of them gave up because they just weren't making very much money at it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's obviously it's a, it's a labor intensive craft, you know, skill intensive uh, uh, production and, um, uh, and uh, probably not, huge margins on, uh, on, on the returns. Uh, I would imagine Games Workshop was probably the, the big exception mm -hmm. for yeah. the money on it because RuneQuest was huge in the 80s in the UK. It was rivaling D&D &D in the marketplace for the most popular RPG, certainly. And I know at Games Day in the UK, it, it beat out D&D &D a number of times for most popular RPG or you know won the top award at Games Day for RPG of the year. And so Games Workshop did, but then, you know, Games Workshop just decided we're not going to license anything from anybody else. We're just going to go with our Warhammer and become a big Warhammer company. Yeah. So they, they ditched everybody, including RuneQuest. Yeah. Well, I love the mini, the pic, because there's pictures of some of these original minis in the book that I just, I, the, the problem that I have with this, Rick, is that I I have the very strong dominant collector gene, and now oh, I have I a list. Relate to that at all? Yeah, I, now I have a list of everything that I'm missing. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. You know, you're always welcome to visit if you come to Chaosium Con this April. You know, you can visit anything in the Mig you want to see. Most of it's in this very room. Yet another reason to try and make this happen. <laughs> yeah. 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 40 years of collecting and this is what you can get it's yeah. it's 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 amazing um i'm gonna let evan have a couple more questions sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there evan so i mean while we're still on miniatures I, you know the 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 detail of the sort of the history who mm -hmm. who was behind it and and even you know leaving some questions still because you know we're a far removed from um from from when those were done um uh, it is fascinating, particularly the fact that sometimes um, molds were lost mm -hmm. or or even destroyed because of you know just the that's the the reality of the the miniature production. Oh. Um, uh, is there um, uh, um, what do you see as you know what what were sort of your favorites uh in in those miniature ranges um was there was there anything that was like you know that that really epitomized uh, the that art uh for uh, for glantha for you oh well going back to the first miniatures done for glorantha by archive miniatures which was a bay area based company greg new neville stoken the owner and major sculptor along with steve lortz one of the other big sculptors who has a long history with chaosium and they just they, they really were standouts compared to so many other miniatures at the time which were detailed but you know the, the ones from archive are super detailed i still love you know like one of my more recent acquisitions is i finally got you know 
a new old stock of the centaurs, which are the massive, uh, you know, iron hoof and bodyguards and all that. And, and just the detail and the artistry on them. It, in some ways, it's a shame that, you know, this is still in the blister after 40 plus years, but, you know, it, it's just, I'm still tracking down a few versions of them. Like I have them painted or I have them not in the, you know, in the plastic still, but yeah. me, I like to have, you know, doubles of some of these things. And sure. so I, I love still tracking down archive minis and all the different ways they package them and the varieties and all that. And so I, I always have had a soft spot for archive miniatures, which were the first. And, you know, they also introduced some things in the Glorantha that weren't in the game because they predated the birth of RuneQuest in 78. And so Neville just went to Greg, like like it says in the MIG. Mm -hmm. Neville went to Greg. So I actually, I got to chat with Neville Stoken about it, and I got to chat with Greg about it as well, of course. But, you know, Neville said, if you want to have a bunch of minis ready to go on the debut of RuneQuest, all we need to do is you got to put Jacko bears, you know, the uh, the pumpkin-headed bears mm -hmm. in Glorantha, take the bug bear, repurpose it, and you've got a Jacko bear. And so that's what they did. And they did that with a number of miniatures. So that way they were able to have an extra dozen miniatures come out right away. And I, I always love the fact that things got added to Glorantha just because of, you know, those type of reasons. And and it's one, and the thing is, quite frankly, the Jacko bear is one of the most iconic creatures in yeah. Glorantha. And a lot of people you know don't realize it was you know predates glorantha and came from something entirely different i did i did not know that um and it is it's one of those things that like the ducks if you if you know anything about glorantha you you, you you've you seen the jacko bear and i think you know obviously i'm a huge fan of runequest glorantha and the fact that we've got some amazingly scary art of the jacko bear Mm -hmm. But I love this mini. Like the the picture that that's in the Mig is just iconic. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> sure. So let me ask you this. Let me. I'll, I'll ask a question here. So what what is new in the Mig three? Yes, that one right there. That. <sighs> yeah. I didn't paint it. I, I I'm a lousy <laughs> painter when it comes to minis, but. If I see one painted, even if I've already got three of it, if it's a cool paint job or yeah, to whatever. snag one, yeah, yep. All right, so what's new and what like I know this has been in the works for a while. What is what are the major updates uh, in three versus uh, volume two? In a sentence, twenty years worth of publications right. information that yeah. you know from nineteen ninety nine because that's where the MIG three was published, and so I had done nominal small updates to my checklists and things like that as I acquired things or found out about things. And, uh, but so many things have been published that a lot of people were saying, you know, the MIG is great. If you want to know what was published in the seventies, eighties and nineties, what about everything after that? And I agreed with them because we've had so many wonderful things come out by such a wide variety of publishers that the MIG almost tripled in size. Yeah. Certainly doubled. I haven't done the math exactly because there's a lot, of, a lot of pictures in the new one. Because you know the the previous two ones are just black and white, very simple. They're right. not. Yeah. No. This is 266 pages, full color. Oh, excellent. Oh, you got one handy. I was trying. Oh, to find I don't. My... No, I thought you did. I, I I did. I just you know like everything else. I I set something down somewhere. Oh, here they are. <laughs> yeah. The uh, yeah, you know the Mig two. You compare that to the yeah, and even the size, even the page size is smaller. I kind of went to the uh, Nomad Gods Digest size, but you know it, it's uh it's a pretty simple just black and white layout mm -hmm. because we were on a budget. This was the nineties, you know. This was you know right at the end of the Reaching Moon Megacorp, and so we kept it pretty simple and fairly low price point and. You know, and of course, that's the updated version compared to the first MIG, which was, you know, even a little bit thinner. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, one of the reasons they grew, quite frankly, is because a lot of the community, other collectors, fans, they were like, hey, I read what was in the MIG and you missed X or Y or these 25 things or, hey, can you add more on this? And it was really great. And, you know, in, in the credits. Toward the mm -hmm. beginning, I thank a lot of people in the support section because 
they came to me with all kinds of things to add and corrections, changes in dates, you name it. And so I, I appreciate all the help I got on that. It was definitely a, a community effort in terms of that. And it's one of the things I really like about the Glorantha Rune Quest community is that it really is a community of like-minded people who bring a lot of passion to the table. A lot of them have been in it for a very long time and they were a tremendous help with the book. That's awesome. And of course, some people just gleefully delight and say, I know something you missed, Rick. I'm like, <laughs> okay, Mr. Suitcase isn't 100% right. And uh, tell me what you got. Well, and I, I can only imagine from the collector side of things, if they do bring something new to your attention, there's this this spark of joy. Hey, there's still something out there that I can I can try and chase down. Well, you know, I it is also a very generous community. Mm -hmm. and, I don't, and I don't know any one person's reasons why. I certainly don't want to ask them why in detail. But a lot of people, when they find something or identify something I don't have, bless them. And I thank them profusely. Sometimes they just give it to me, mm -hmm. especially when they want it to be kind of in the archives, right. in the overall collection. And, you know, just, just the other day, I got given this. And it was, you know, convention scenarios run okay. uh, for RuneQuest. And it was back in the 90s. I remember this being at Convulsion and such. And I, I, I'd kind of forgotten about it. And, you know, you know, Shannon Appleklein was happy to make me a tremendously sweet deal on it. So thank oh, you. That's Shannon. awesome. Was well, awesome. and, uh, you know, I've benefited from that. Uh, my, the the one of the gl the Gloranthin classics I was missing, you reached out to me and said, hey, you said you, you're missing this. And like, it works both ways. It does. It was amazing. I'm, I'm happy. I, I, will, I will say this to the collecting community as a whole. If there's something you're trying to track down or something I might have a duplicate copy of, because like I said, I've made buying mistakes. <laughs> oh, I forgot I had that and bought another one. I, I, I am happy to help other people in the community get a hold of as best I can whatever is missing from their collection because i know it's going to bring a lot of happiness to other people and i certainly don't need you know multiple copies of all kinds of stuff i think i think that the the spirit of the gloranthan community I, i'm not going to say i'm not going to say where it starts but it definitely flows from the top down and from the the people like it it is an all-encompassing uh spirit of generosity it's one of the reasons that evan and i are definitely you know clan chaosium so all right evan i've been talking you know what i'm gonna say we, we are, are all us, us. and yeah, we are all us no doubt about it. <laughs> um yeah and one of the things i love uh, well you just mentioned channel shannon Applecline, and you know you and he and you know there are some some others but that are sort of the leading um uh, documenters of uh, of our hobby, you very focused, of course, on Chaosium for obvious reasons, and and Glorantha, and uh, he even with his with his uh, designers and dragons, designers, designers and, and dragons. dragons, you know, sort of magisterial, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, overview of the entire industry, uh, are preserving the the memories for people that uh, I think um, uh, help illustrate. You know the best things about uh, the the hobby, the creativity, the interplay. You know, like you do, you just held up that that uh, that bugbear, jacko bear miniature. That um, you know the interplay of creativity and um, the development of the 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 games that have uh, informed um, the the trajectory on this. You know the. Glorantha is not a um, a you know a one person or sort of faceless committee development. It is filled with uh, happenstance and whimsy, heretics and madmen, um, <laughs> all the above. All the above. And uh, and so I love the um, the documenting uh, with. You know, physical artifacts with with the mm -hmm. with the printed words uh, that that are throughout this. Um, and uh, was there 
was there a discovery in the last you know 20 years so this covers up to 2015 and sort of leaves off before the the latest edition of, mm -hmm. of RuneQuest, which of course is very well documented um and and the development of the johnstown compendium um which of course is you know living electronic documents um uh that are collected but is there something in that that up to 2015 period that was you know sort of the most um uh surprising or 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 happy discovery um as you were archiving and and collecting and and uh and documenting all of this there are there are all, yeah. Yes, there, there are actually a number of them. I, it, it's hard to pick just one. Sure. Because one of, one of the big changes between the 90s and now is the wonderful thing called the internet, which, okay, it was there in the 90s, but it was so much more primitive. A lot of people, there weren't a lot of websites developed like there are now. Mm -hmm. And the internet's also made it a lot easier to track a lot of people down. And so probably the single biggest difference between what I did for the nineties and what I did for this version is I've been just not systematically, but certainly thoroughly trying to track down while they're still alive. Cause we've obviously lost some people yeah. that I certainly wish I could have talked a lot more to, yeah. but you know, I just made a more conscious effort to track people down and I've, I've had, you know, knock on wood, great success getting hold of a lot of people. I never thought I would have been able to track down sometimes a lot more quickly than I thought. That's awesome. And, and so been talking with all kinds of authors, artists, people who used to work for Chaosium and just heard their stories. And they've just told me all kinds of things. I mean, I learned a lot more about Games Workshop, for example, because I tracked down and got a hold of Dave Morris, who wrote a lot of the Rune Rights articles for White Dwarf magazine after right. Oliver Dickinson kind of retired from that. He was involved with a lot of the RuneQuest Demons articles and the Demons miniatures and of course knew a lot of people at Games Workshop and he filled in a lot of gaps for me on what I basically had almost no information on and you know sometimes it was just for the price of a phone call which now is basically free I, I was able to just I called people up and sometimes to my very pleasant surprise they'd be like sure I got half an hour to talk about the good old days you know awesome, they man. you know and just you know, people like Yurik Chodak talking about the RuneQuest maps he worked on and the graphic design he did and what it was like working in the Chaosium warehouse because everybody had their turn working in the Chaosium warehouse and, and just chatting with him for an hour about what he worked on and what he did. And so it, it's that was the single biggest thing is I just got to spend a lot of time. That That's where a lot of the stories and history and all that come from mm. about the what never was is. You know, like with the RuneQuest 3 ones, it was me chatting with Ken Ralston at length and him just telling me, here's what, you know, never got published or here's the manuscripts we had that didn't end up, you know, and, and, you know, he was very generous with his time. And he also said, you know, I've had those manuscripts sitting in my basement for the last umpteen years. Can I send them to you? And so I'm like, well, if you got to. Yeah, I mean, I'll twist if my arm on that. Basement, I'll take them <laughs> off your hands, and 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 so you know, I it's just things like that. The the generosity, the willingness to share stories and talk about those times. A lot of times, the people you know they'd left the industry and hadn't talked about it really at length with anybody yeah. for sometimes thirty, even forty years. Wow. You know, William Church, I chatted with him and he said, you know, oh, after about 1981 or so, after he'd just done a few of the last maps and everything, he tried to get in the industry as an artist, but it didn't work out. He went back to being a, you know, a contractor for home construction. And that's what he's been doing for the last 40 years. Yeah. And those stories just really uh, shine through in, in this new edition. Yeah. Um, they're, they're just nuggets of of people you track down anecdotes um and and like you said man, rediscovered manuscripts or at least hints of the manuscripts mm -hmm. um and oftentimes as i was reading through i thought oh will any of this ever see print will we see it come to to life and uh you know wonderfully um you know something that i had heard about and uh, that is covered um uh and and now is 
uh, in a form available was the new Lolan Gospel and all the Imther work that mm -hmm. that had been that developed. Me. Yeah, yeah, and and now it's a Johnstown Compendium, a, a huge supplement um, that uh, is available to the community, and um, that that both makes me very excited and gives me a lot of hope that other things might come through that cycle. Obviously yeah. not all of the, 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 what never was will become, but some of them might. And, uh, you might. know, so it's, it, it's exciting, uh, to, to see that. Um, yeah. You know, some of the, what never was is never got beyond the concept stage. Like when I talk about the room quest two Aztecs project, mm -hmm. which, you know, Ken St. Andre and one of his colleagues from Texas, they Arizona, sorry, they had it all scoped out. They pitched to Chaosium. Chaosium said yes. They signed a contract, and then it just all fell apart within a couple of months. And so basically nothing got written. I asked Ken about it. He's like, "Oh yeah, my buddy was going to do most of that because his buddy. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he had published some Aztecs articles in Different Worlds magazine, and it was kind of a gearing up." to do the RuneQuest Aztec supplement. But then I guess life got in the way and the project has kind of quickly died. And I asked Ken, you know, is there a manuscript or anything out there? And he's like, I don't know, I saw a page or two maybe, but that was just general Aztec stuff yeah. that ended up in different worlds and such. Yeah, so. yeah, so that would have been, yeah, that is a that is a uh, an exciting thing seeing, having, being able to, uh, having played Ken St. Andrews Stormbringer uh, rules and thinking of you know bringing that sort of uh, flair to uh, Aztecs yeah, that, that would have been really cool that would have been right up uh, Evan's alley <laughs> yeah. so so on exploring Loranta we tend to focus in on for players who are new to players and GMs who are new to um, RuneQuest to Glorantha to the whole um to the whole world. And I realize if you are this far into the episode, you may this most of this may have been going right over your head because this is really a living history of everything that's ever been published for this world that we love. And so one of my questions uh, to both of you is if you were speaking to new players, what would your selling point on this be? Mine is the amazing master index at the back of the book and this master index covers uh let me pull it up the master lists the scenarios there's just so many here scenarios uh spirit magic rune magic sorcery skills and creatures it is mm -hmm. just this massive list of if you want to know what else exists in the world whether it's sorcery or creatures or magic or scenarios here is the list and here's where to find them and yeah. like for me that was really inspiring as a gm but i was let me ask you guys like for a for a new gm what is the selling point that you think uh for uh the mig i'm happy to let evan go first all right have... <laughs> let, up, let, um, let fans sell your product yeah. for that's right well, exactly. that's, i mean that's very fair uh well i think uh, the selling point for the MIG, I, it's not going to be for every beginner, I think. Um, you know, the starter set is for that or, um, uh, or the, the, the quick start. Mm -hmm. But for the, the person who's trying to get a, a, a grip on uh, the, uh, the world and uh, its logic um, and the, the mini uh, features that it, that it has, uh, I think um, that uh, it's it's very informative because it it uh, points to all of the wells of you know sort of creativity that uh, feed into Glorantha. I think it uh, offers uh, a lot in terms of sort of firing your imagination, you know, as uh, as different approaches. You know, it, Glorantha can work as a, a, a miniature uh, focused uh, place. Um, but of course, a lot of people use uh, theater of the mind, but it, it can be a, a place where a lot of different game systems have operated, um, where uh, fan work 
has been and continues to be um, encouraged mm -hmm. um, that, uh, you know, the variance from, you know, a particular storyline uh, is, um, is not a problem that, uh, that, you know, your Glorantha will vary is embodied in almost every page yes. of the, of the MIG because of the, the, real flourishing of fan creativity, the embrace uh, of that. Um, and, you know, people come with, you know, open hearts and real good intentions to, to, uh, uh, to, to honor the work and do something fun. That, uh, that's just throughout the pages of, of the, uh, the MIG. And for people, I think a lot of people who come to these sorts of games have a sense of history and have a sense of of tradition and like to be part of that. And this welcomes you in uh, to that as well. So um, it's you know less intimidating um, than uh, the, uh, the Guide to Glorantha. It's, um, it's maybe less applicable than the Glorantha source book, but it uh, really uh, opens uh, a new dimension to the the world, how it developed, who the 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 creative contributors were, and to see that there were so many artists, mm -hmm. uh, miniaturists, uh, uh, writers, um, and as I say, dreamers, heretics, and madmen. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh, I you 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 you. Thank you, Evan. You said a lot of great things. That oh. it, it. I I my goals were pretty simple. I I wanted to provide lists of where things were mm -hmm. because as we all know, and some people see it as a criticism, other people see it as a strength, that there's such a breadth and wealth of material for Glorantha. It's to some people say it's just too much. Yeah. And okay, it, it is an awful lot. It's more than most people would be. If you wanted to get it all, it's almost impossible to get it all. Even I don't have everything that's out there. I'm, I'm keep shrinking that list down, but I keep finding stuff that gets added to my list as well. And so, you know, one of the goals of the MIG was to allow people to say, like, when they find something they love in Glorantha and they want to find out more about just that, like certain creatures, you can look up where those creatures are documented if you wanted to get the stats for a scenario you want to write or whatever else. Uh, you'll know exactly what publications would have it. Some of those are available as PDF. A lot of them are available on the secondary market, you know, be it, you know, online auctions or whatever. There are lots of places to get the bulk of what's in the book. You know, some of it's extremely rare. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. But there are a lot of core publications, even mm -hmm. of you know, past iterations of the game, be it RQ3 or, you know, whatever. You can get hold of them if you got a little bit of time and a little bit of patience and a little bit of money. And that way, if you want to run a campaign set in the West, and you between Nick Brooks' wonderful Johnstown Compendium catalogs lets you know all the stuff that you can get on Drive Through RPG in the you know Johnstown Compendium series of publications, uh, you know. But if you're looking for older material that was published back in the 80s, 90s, early thousands, before we came up with the Johnstown Compendium, you can you can find out where certain cults were written up. So like, okay, I, I need some you know, cults from the East Isles. Well, you can find out where all the East Isles information is fairly quickly if you have just a little bit of a idea where it might be. And so, yeah, you know, you want to use certain cults. There's a list of all the cults and where they're written mm -hmm. up and which ones are partial and which ones are complete. Because one of the frustrations of anybody is, especially when you're on a budget, and for a long time I was on a budget too. Mm -hmm. I was just lucky that I started collecting early when a lot of stuff was five or 10 bucks instead of a hundred bucks now. Right. But you know, you don't want to waste your money on something that's not going to have like more than a paragraph of content in it when you were hoping it was a whole chapter or a whole book and or it's just all stats and you wanted history. And so this is kind of like a, a buyer's guide on where you'd want to spend your limited budget to get the most information or the best information about any particular topic, because that's what I recommend to anybody who's just starting with Glorantha, of course, buy the starter set. Yeah. RuneQuest starter set. And then when you decide what you want to go next, based on maybe reading the Glorantha source book, which is kind of a high level view of a lot of things in the world, or maybe if you did a deeper dive and have the guide to Glorantha, but now you want to start, oh, I really like this part of the world. I, I want to look at, look at Pamela. Uh, 
you know, you can very quickly find out, especially if you have the PDF of the MIG. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to do a text search for Pameltella yeah. and find the major products and I have that in there. And as always, I, I'd like to give a plug for, you know, if, if you buy from chaosium.com in particular, if you buy the PDF now for the book, while it's still being printed, mm -hmm. you, get, you get a discount coupon for the price of that PDF when the printed book comes out. And of course, when the printed book is out, if you buy it direct from Chaosium, you get the PDF for free. And so that way you kind of get the best. I, I love paper books, mm -hmm. but I also like the searchability of electronic ones. And so that's one of the things I like best about the PDF is it's real easy to jump around. If you click on the index, it takes you right to what particular product you want to look at and and the text search for like i want to find out where the you know mustali are mentioned yep that they're into dwarves or ducks like you and i are yeah well I will, i'll be honest that was that was my i had a moment of lament so that one of the things i love about chaosium is what you just said like you put the pdf out early and if i buy the pdf that is discounted off the final price of the the physical book because when you buy physical books from chaosium you get the pdfs with them and mm -hmm. as Evan mentioned, we got a review copy. And for like like a day, I was like, this is awesome, but now I'm gonna have to pay full price for the book. <laughs> oh no, no, I would still be paying full price for the book. I just split it up into two. All right, it was, uh, so it was great. Like, I, I love the fact that, and you guys take in if like comments and edits at some, you know, sometimes. Well, for, especially for this book, yeah. where without trying to be egotistical, it was all written, created, yeah by me i had some people do some very helpful copy editing on it and content editing as well and but i, I wanted to throw it out to the general mm -hmm. collecting and community as a whole because yeah i've, I've got you know, like on brp central forums there's a, a thread of where rick this is a typo or rick <laughs> you might want to adjust this or hey rick i got something you don't have and it's all welcome and yeah. I, I enjoy that kind of feedback and quite frankly i needed it I mean, you, you should have seen the amount of feedback I got back in the 90s when they first came out. Oh. You know, all kinds of things I was missing or, oh, no, that date's right. It's a lot harder to research this stuff unless I actually had a physical copy of it and right. really paid attention. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot about how to put together a book in terms of being an author and the content with it. And, and so I, I've had wonderful feedback already. And now that it's going off to the printers, I have to turn that tap off. But I, I think I've left it open long enough now that yeah. I've got the you know, 95% of it. And, you know, so be it, you know, I, mm -hmm. if, if other things get added over time, I'll, I'll at least update the PDF at some right. time. In the future. Right. Or I can always update it, uh, you know, for another printing. I don't know when that'll be. I don't have any plans for that. Uh, but yeah, I, all, all those kind of suggestions are welcome. Well, and I gotta say, um, you mentioned that this sort of started because of the auction. And I have to say, if you guys can make it to a Chaosium auction, whether it's at Chaosium Con or wherever another one may spring up, I enjoyed everything I did at Chaosium Con last year. And I would say after hanging out with Evan, because I'm contractually obligated to say that was the best part. After that, the Chaosium auction was the, was the highlight of of chaosium con for me because again as as you said you you just you built a story around each item and everyone else was just as invested in you know whether uh my brain just died who was the call of cthulhu who, mike mason who, mike, mike mason was just as just as much of a storyteller and a wonderful i'm not going to say salesman a wonderful presenter of the item that just sitting back and watching it was was just amazing. Like I think Evan, you and I have talked about that several times. Yeah. That was a great. It was a great event. I learned a lot, and uh, you know that's. Uh, I I like not just playing the games, but knowing about them and knowing the history. And I think you know Glorantha sort of attracts people of that personality yes. profile. And I was actually going to say yeah. that. That is for me the other great thing about the MIG is that if you are one of these people who comes to Glorantha excited by the history and excited by the lore, 
then you're probably also the kind of person who wants to know the history of it in the real world. And this is just a wonderful timeline by, by product line, essentially, of, of that history. It pairs, you know, there's also the Greg Stafford Library, um, the, the, the campaign book that you guys released at Chaosium last year is another just kind of snapshot of history. This is just a snapshot of history in a different way. And I love it. Like, I mean, obviously that's, that's sort of my jam. I enjoy digging into his, the history of things. And so I'm really glad we got to sit down and, and, and chat with you about this because I've been really looking forward to this since it was announced. Oh yeah. I oh, always happy to talk about it. Cause I, I, I love the history of Chaosium as well. I'm yeah. kind of, you know, as I, as I kind of tell in the story about there where, you know, Greg, you know, suggested back in the nineties that, Hey, you should become a historian for, you know, RuneQuest and Chaosium. And I, I kind of took him up on it with kind of, just kind of eased into it. It wasn't like a formal job with a formal yeah. description, but I, I certainly got inspired by that to say more, learn more, document more. Yeah. And in some ways, probably one of my biggest regrets if I have any regrets about the book, besides having taken so long to finally have a new edition come out, is that don't let the name of the book title fool you. It was, like I said, it was me trying to be clever with the whole MIG and, you know, Soviet aircraft thing. Uh, because there were, at that time, there was a lot of Soviet things going on in the world, but also the whole Nick Brook, Chris Gidlow, the Lunar Army is the Red Army, and mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of lunar things are Soviet parallel, a lot, of, a lot of humor going into all of that. So that was kind of the culture, especially the Reaching One Megacorp at that time. And so I kind of riffed off of that. But don't let the word index in the title turn you off, because it's not some dry no. list or index of terms, or it's like a dictionary or things like that. I mean, those have their purposes, but this this is a lot more about the stories and background and information. And, and it's, it's to me, it, it's, it's, it's mainly storytelling in many respects that holds it all together. It, it's not just some, you know, sure, there are some lists in there mm -hmm. because like I said, it's a reference for if you want to look up where things are, but that's, you know, just a minor, section in the back of the book of you know out of 264 pages the actual lists and such are the last really you know 50 pages yeah you know the master, pages. master lists which yeah okay they're not the most thrilling there but you know mm -hmm. the master lists start on page 219 out of 264 pages so yeah. it's got a section but most of it you know, I, I just got to enjoy photographing things from my collection and mm -hmm. trying to be all Mr. You know, Insta Instagram and you know, Pinterest and things like that with, ooh, how can I delightfully put these out and, you know, present them with not too many shadows? And my wife is like, do we ever get our dining room table back? <laughs> because she'd walk out there and she's like, okay, you dragged out all your minis this time or you dragged out all the, you know, cover the whole, luckily we have a big dining room table. So hey, it's, it is a beautiful book. Yeah. And, and practical. I will say yeah. a friend of ours showed us on camera yesterday yep. something her father had pulled out of his archives. A uh, and and I immediately pulled up the MIG and identified it as either a second or third printing of White Bear and Red Moon yep. in its original Ziploc bag. Yeah. Um, I couldn't tell whether or not it had the green errata sheet, which would identify it as a second printing. Um, uh, but uh, nerd but, you know collectors you I know think you, you look not, at it I'm, and, a, I'm a jm is third yeah, yeah. I, I it's probably but um but in any case um again immediately useful yeah. uh if you are a collector um this is essential well that the, the funny thing about that is she showed us that and that was also the night that we kind of established that uh we had to split our split our month of gaming up into one game and another and everyone most people voted to play RuneQuest Glorantha so it was just it was serendipitous we did we did this interview we're starting a new uh RuneQuest game and she got a copy of White Bear Red Moon which I told her to bring in when she visits and I'm pretty sure she'll leave with it <laughs> oh no it got lost in, in the visit that's cool I, I always enjoy those kind of stories yeah. And and I'm and I'm happy when people reach out to me and say, you know, Rick, can you help identify or even yeah. sometimes even evaluate, you know, collectibles? Because 
they have some of them have really gone up in price mm -hmm. and unfortunately we're getting them an age mm -hmm. where on people pass away and i i am happy and honored if i get contacted especially from relatives of whoever's passed away and they're like we we heard you know about this kind of stuff and you know can you help us evaluate what the most important items are so we don't you know give away family silver kind of things yeah and and yeah i'm happy to be that part of the community as well where i can i can help people awesome. in in obviously a very tough situation yeah. yeah yeah well evan any final comments or or thoughts before we wrap this uh well this i guess we, up? i mean we have the president of chaosium here of course if there's a a, a short you know spiel of what what we can expect obviously you can't make any promises and you don't want to give away oh. any company secrets, but Chaosium is famous for overpromise. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you, you and Jeff have been working really hard yeah. not to see, do that. So see the much. MIG. <laughs> well, you look at the what never was. Yeah, that's right. We're yeah. trying to eliminate the what never was. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you share about what I was? That was going to be my final question. So Evan and I are once again uh, in sync on that. In sync yeah. on that. So, like, is there anything you can share about 2023? Uh, no. This is the year where the Cults of Garantha series of books is going to go to print. Awesome. And the goal is to have them out later this year. And we have three out of the 10 volume series basically done. And we plan on sending a batch of them off to the printers relatively soon. And so, you know, we, 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 we backed off from the original plan of having a big slipcase set of yeah. books because if, if nothing else it was going to have a pretty high price point on it yeah when you're talking a thousand pages of material covering over a hundred major cults plus lots of history uh you know all kinds of things in there beyond that you know talk about myths at a high level talk about the monomyth yeah and so we're like you know it's going to take us longer than obviously we wanted to get that out as a full set to get everything right for everything and so we just decided also just to make it easier for people who want to invest over time versus, you know, you're, if you're at a, like our convention booth and you saw that slipcase set of all the cults books, awesome as it would be, it's like, do I want to spend $200, $300 mm -hmm. and get it all when in installments, they might very well get it all. Right. And so we're really heading more toward the 128 page book okay. philosophy. Some are bigger than that. But dividing it up, I actually uh, wrote down some of the main topics. Uh, you know, we have an overview book, which includes the monomyth and cult basics, you know, the classic cult outline, and the, here's how a cult generally functions, you know, the 80, 90% of the, you know, cases yeah. of how it is. Just good background. There's a book on darkness, you know, the troll cults and other darkness cults. Uh, we kind of did it not quite rune based, but, you know, there's a book on all the sea cults, okay. you know, Dormal. One, you know, sea creatures, all that. And of course, a lot of these have lots of background history and myths and other information. There's a book on earth cults, a uh, book on fire and sky cults, a uh, book on storm cults, uh, a book on shamans, spirit okay. magic, and beast cults. Okay. And then there's the lunar book on all the lunar cults and related. There's a book on all the chaos cults, kind of like cults of terror yes. dialed up to 11. And of course, there's a Prospedia, which is an overview of all the cults for people who just want a more of a general, you know, elevator pitch level amount of information on all the cults to try to, you know, especially if you're going to be developing things or want to design your own material. That way you can kind of get at least an overview of where you want to focus your time on. And so I just mentioned 10 books. Yeah. I, that, that's all that I need to know. Like, and we'll have you on when we, cause we're, you know, we're going to do a review of them because this is, this is, this is the meat of the show. And this is the meat of Lorantha, the myths, the cults. Um, I can't wait to see, uh, these books as they start rolling out. That's and very exciting. the, the amount of information is awesome. The amount of art and graphic design that's going to these books is there incredibly visual. I, I, I would show you some of that, but marketing wants to have a yeah, lot no, of first totally on that. They kind of said, hey, Rick, don't give away everything <laughs> while, you, while you're talking with your friends. You know? 
but you know it, it the, the amount of art i know jeff's been sharing a lot of art mm -hmm. from the cults yeah. books especially on our facebook group the RuneQuest yeah. facebook group which is a great place especially if you want to see the visual part of the project i'd recommend anybody drop into that because yeah. jeff posts there every week if not many days a week giving a lot of snippets and samples and talking about things and of course answering questions as well it's a yeah. conversation not just a a billboard or a marketing page it's right. it's very much i mean that's where you can find bits and pieces of things that ended up in the mig where i'll talk about jack of as a topic and i'll show you know photo of the painting or other covers that have had jack of on it things like that but you know the runequest facebook group is a really great resource awesome. for all kinds of things like we'll that. put a link to that in the show notes that would be awesome yeah. well rick thank you so much this this was amazing and um i cannot wait to uh see the cults books as they come out and again just continue to explore Glorantha. next month we're going to be back we're going to be looking at uh god time starting our our temporal march through Glorantha, explaining the high level things of you know we'll break god time up into several months and then we'll we'll do the ages that's probably we're gonna spend a lot of time this year apparently intermixed with uh with uh drooling over the new um cult books that are coming out from chaosium so rick thank you for joining us evan as always thanks for exploring uh Glorantha with me and uh, sharing right, this passion that we have happy to be here look forward to the next time uh, thank you for letting me talk about the MIG and try to explain it to those that are like, I don't want to buy a big index. That's right. <laughs> well, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. We'll be back next month with more Exploring Glorantha. Have a good one. Thank you. Take care. Welcome to this episode.